Okay, so we are live with Lisa Mann. Welcome, Lisa. Hello. Hi, thanks, thanks for, for being here. Thank you for having me. And so Lisa's a blues bassist. Is that a good description of your music and abilities? Yeah, bass player, vocalist, band leader, songwriter, uh, manager, boss lady, booking agent. So I just kind of like wear a lot of hats. <laughs> and we're specifically, I'm excited to talk to you today about this new album that you just got put out called Old Girl. Mm -hmm. And I want to talk about some of the songs on that and some of your live gigs. You were just telling us about being down in Salem on Thursday night. Yeah, yeah. So uh, there's a place called Gilgamesh Brewing, and they have several different locations. And uh, yeah, there's a wonderful guy named Lee who hired us, and uh, Sonny Hess and I played uh, a couple of gigs at a couple different locations down there. It was nice to see some friends that we hadn't seen for quite a long time, because frankly, even when I was busy and working a lot, I didn't have a lot of gigs in Salem. So there was some wonderful people that we, we hadn't seen for a while. Melody and Steve and Deb and all our buddies down there. And then tonight you're going to be up in Northeast Portland at um, Blue Diamond. I've been to that is, place a little bit. Is it Southeast or is Southeast, it? Southeast, Northeast, East Side. Yeah, it's on the East Side, 20th and Sandy. Uh, yeah, the Blue Diamond. Uh, that's, I call it Portland's juke joint. You know, and she, Sunny Hats, she got the whole back street, the whole street is blocked off. It's completely covered in big tents that are like bolted to the ground. She's got a covered stage. It's like ready to rock and roll, rain or shine. I it's love it. Cool. Very safe, social distance, outside. You got masks required, you gotta get reservations. It's all very COVID safe. So I feel safe and the patrons feel safe and, and we just feel like, we can relax and have, have fun. Now, what does it feel like to get out and play live again? It's, it's really nice. And it's really nice to play with Jason Thomas. Uh, Michael Ballish is going to be playing the drums. I've done a couple of gigs with Dave Million on the drums. And it's just good to pal around with those guys and, and play. But I also noticed that my, uh, my schlepping muscles are weak. So... I was used to schlepping, you know, big speaker cabinets and stuff and just hauling them to and from the car and then hanging a bass on my neck for like three hours at a time. And so after, after Thursday's gig, I was kind of like, wow, man, ooh, my back hurts. That bass is almost as big as you are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's not too heavy. It's only about, you know, here it is, you know, it's only about nine pounds. So it's actually pretty lightweight uh, and very well balanced. Uh, I had a shoulder injury some years ago, so I tend to wear it on my, on my right shoulder. So I have a, kind of a weird way of carrying it. So again, it's like, I've been at home. I've been doing some stuff, some studio stuff. I've been playing, sitting down and doing some live streams. So standing up for several hours, it's like, okay, Remember how to do this? <laughs> it's like, come on, muscles, let's go. <laughs> now, speaking of that, what do you do now during these crazy times or in general? I mean, this is hard physically to, to do a three-hour live set, like physically, emotionally, mentally. How do you keep yourself in tip-top shape? Well, you know, I should have been playing more at home standing up. I should have been doing that because I realized, oh, man, I was really sore afterward. So I'll probably be doing a little more of that just to keep that muscle set going. But um, I do, we walk, uh, we try to walk every day, my husband and I, and there's just a nice little couple of routes that, you know, you turn this way and you see some different things. And, and uh, yeah, we try to do that every day if we can. If, you, if it's raining, yeah, put a little raincoat on and go. And uh, I, I do little calisthenics around the house too. I'll do some push-ups. I also have a kind of a unique uh, from being, you know, touring musician and working in hotels and stuff for many years. Uh, I learned how to work out with with like a towel or a T-shirt and how to do isometrics, you know, with a towel. 
And uh, I so I still, it. I still do some of that. I've got some rubber bands and yeah, just you know, nothing really formal, but just, you know, uh, and jumping up and down, uh, what do they call them? Just, um, the isometric jumps. Biometric. Like, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the, the explosive jumping. I yeah. try to do that to keep my bones in shape. Yeah. Um, so, you know, there's a lot that people can do. You don't have to go to a gym. There's a lot that we can do even with milk jugs to stay in shape. So. Yes. Yeah. I love it. Okay. Let's talk about old girl. Here's my autograph copy. Oh, I felt so special when I got this in the mail. And so it's a mix of these, this like slow bluesy and then rocking. And then you have LaRonda on that backup vocals on that one. It's like a tribute yeah. uh, to musicians that have passed away. Which song are we going to talk about first? I don't even know. What about the tribute song? Were you thinking of any musicians in particular when you were writing that song? Yes, actually I was. There are, uh, a, there's a set of paintings at the Blue Diamond uh, that were done by an artist named P.M. Shore. And she's been featured on Artbeat. And uh, it was primarily, uh, uh, you know, be, those photos primarily were the reason I wrote the song. But I also thought about there's other clubs, nightclubs, where local musicians are memorialized with its food photographs or paintings. Um, so these paintings memorialize um, Janice Scroggins, uh, Paulette Davis, Linda Hornbuckle, and uh, Paul DeLay. And I knew all of them except Paulette. I, I actually came back to town from Seattle <clears throat> just after Paulette had passed away. Uh, but, but I knew, uh, uh, the other three qu quite well and played with Paul DeLay for, for about a year or so. Uh, so anyway, there was a conversation that happened at the Blue Diamond where a musician who hadn't been in town that long asked me, Hey, what's the significance of those paintings up there? Who were those people? And I thought, well, let me tell you who they were, you know, and, and that conversation was the basis for the song. It was like, hey, let me tell you who these people were. You might not know them because they weren't in the Rolling Stone magazine or something. So they weren't maybe nationally recognized as much, but we remember them. We will, we will remember them always around here in this bar. So that's what that song's about. And so that's why I asked Louis Payne to play organ because he uh, he worked with Paul DeLay for many years. I asked uh, LaRonda and Arietta. Uh, they, you know, uh, worked with Linda Hornbuckle for so many years. Um, and, and Sonny Hess worked with uh, Paulette. We all worked with Janice Scroggins. Um, so that's why I asked that particular set of people. And of course, Brian Foxworth, um, who loved Janice and, and Linda so much. Uh, and he sang, he kind of sang the duet kind of stuff on the outro with me. And yeah, it's just, just a tribute to these wonderful people, but it also keep it broad. I didn't want to be too specific because I want to remember people like Sean Costello, um, uh, people in other cities and other, in other places that, that live in, uh, people's hearts. That's so beautiful. And there's some phrase, I might botch it, but it felt like it's something along the lines of the person is never really gone as long as you still say their name out loud or as long as you're still remembered and they're still around sort of in the yeah. ether, this concept, right? So keeping their, keeping them alive. Their songs, you know, we listen to their songs and, you know, I recorded The Blues Is My Medicine and that's a song that uh, Paulette Davis wrote. And even though I never met her, I feel like I, I know her because uh, you know, I, Sonny's my best bud, and I hear all these stories about her, and I've seen so many videos, and so, uh, you know, we keep these people alive by, by doing their songs. The Strange Tones covered a uh, 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 $14 in the bank, Paul DeLay song, so, you know, we all try to, you know, keep, keep their music alive. I love it. Mm. Okay, now this monkey song, can I tell what, what it's about? 
<laughs> you're dating a guy that's got monkeys in the house. Are they literal monkeys? Are those monkeys, is it a metaphor for something? This is not a metaphor. <laughs> this is a true story. I, I swear to God. <laughs> The, there's there's a, a singer from U, Eugene. Her name's Joanne Bro. I don't know if you've heard of Joanne Bro. Um, she's a she's a hoot. She's fun. She dances on stage in these big high heels. She kicks her kicks her legs up in the air. And she sings her ass off. Uh, but she and I were doing a show in Eugene, uh, like a women's uh, show. I think it might have been a Rosetta tribute. I think it might have been a Rosetta tribute. So. I asked her, hey, how did you and Robert meet? That's her sweetheart. And, uh, you know, they've been together for many years. And she said, well, let me tell you the story. She's very warm. So she, she was holding my hand with both of her hands. And she was telling me this story about she, she, she really loved this guy, but he had a traveling monkey show. And so he had this trailer with these monkeys and like a raccoon that the people would pay to see the monkey and the raccoon fight. And, you know, I mean, he had a trailer with all the painting on it, the old timey scrolls and the, you know, the pictures like, like a circus sideshow kind of thing. And she said one day, you know, she tried to deal with this, but one day a monkey bit her on the ass. And that's when she said, you know, it's the monkeys or me, buddy. And I looked her in the eye and I said, I'm writing the song right now. It just started happening. It's just the wheels. I mean, she wasn't even done finishing the sentence. And, you know, within a few days, I, I finished the song. So I it's a story it. that had to be told, but there's a little bit of a metaphor in it. I, I, I made the last verse. Like if you got a monkey on your back or you have friends that like to monkey around, it's like if you know if you have addiction or whatever it is, you you better get your act together if you want to find true love. I love it. Okay, so I I can't decide which one's my favorite, but I sure do love "Old Girl." I think it might be my favorite. Well, thank I wish you. I could sing as beautifully as you, because I would belt it out right now. "Old Girl Living in a Young Girl's World," and I love how positive every song on this album it's not like woe is me i'm getting old it's like you know what i'm feeling pretty good i'm a little i got some gray hair but you know what was your inspiration for that song well you might find this kind of interesting um a lot of it's kind of i've, I've kind of been feeling like in an in-between place Kind of like when you're not quite a teenager. I think women go through these phases in our lives when you're not a little girl anymore, but you're not a cool teenager. And you're not a teenager anymore, but you're not a grown up. It's like the college years, you know? And then there's this, it's like, I'm not ready to be, you know, an older woman. I'm not ready to do that, you know? I'm just still, my heart is still 16 years old. So as I'm approaching, you know, I was, I'm 50 now, and I was approaching 50, and I actually started writing a heavy metal album. And so I was like, I was writing these songs just for my own benefit, because I grew up loving heavy metal. And I was writing these songs, and then I was making the decision whether or not to create an album and record an album. And I was thinking, you know, who's going to want, you know, a 50 year old woman making a heavy metal record. And besides, I'm a blues artist. I'm supposed to be, you know, you're supposed to just do this one thing. So the line came to me, feels like I'm starting out brand new. And that isn't an easy thing to do for an old girl. And then the song just went, it just came out. The song just came out. And that's really where it came from was like, is this something I am supposed to be doing? I'm just, you know, I, I, I'm not, you know, in my twenties, am I supposed to be making a heavy metal record and, 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 uh, you know, and wearing all this black eyeliner and bleaching my hair. Am I supposed to be doing all of that stuff? It's like, I don't care. I'm going to do it anyway. Now, did you make the heavy metal album? I did. I did, and it's actually uh, in, in the first round Grammy voting right now. So. Oh my goodness, is that the White Crone? White Crone, yeah, let me see, I think I have it right here. 
White Crone the Poisoner. Yeah. Nice. So that's for fans of bands like Black Sabbath and Judas Priest and Iron Maiden, especially. Yeah. Ronnie girl. James Dio, a lot of influence there. So when I back in my twenties, I used to do a lot of spin classes and I loved Ozzy during the spin class. <laughs> Ozzy. Yeah, I was a big Ozzy fan. High school. Of course. I drew his logo on my peachy. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this might be too out there and philosophical for today's combo, but what do you think about this? I call it the invisibility cloak, where like once you, once women reach a certain age, it's like it, you, no one even sees you. Like yeah. you're invisible. And I was talking to a girlfriend yesterday who's in her 70s. She goes, ah, I love it. I can do whatever I want. Nobody pays any attention to me. Yeah, it is weird being called ma'am. <laughs> the first ma time you ever called ma'am do you remember when that happened and you're like oh. i don't remember i'm not sure it might have been like in a store or something like ma'am what what how did i get to be a ma'am <laughs> i don't know you know well you know i think there's there is that invisibility cloak but i think along with that um you know i don't get the sexist comments i used to get and I don't get the, I don't get club owners and people telling me what to wear. Cause I used to get that a lot. Why don't you wear skirts? You should wear a skirt, young lady. You know, I, I don't get that shit anymore, which is really nice. Pardon my French. I don't know. It's okay to say curse that. Away. You know. Curse away. Curse <laughs> away. So I don't get that BS anymore. Uh, but um, I do get some cat collie type attention like in messenger but they're from older men that are you know retirees and there's this one guy this this french guy who constantly sends he hasn't done it in a while so i don't maybe he moved on to somebody else but he's constantly sending me these messages with pictures of me and it will, it will say "Ooh, i love Mon chéri, I love, in t-shirt, I love, you know, it's like, okay, this is All right. interesting, but it's not like I'm going to be walking down the street and go, hey, baby, how you doing, you know, so there is that, but there's also a respect that I've gained, I don't know if it's just because people, they know what I've been doing for a while, they know who I, who I am, you know, but if I, you know, well, in the before time anyway, if I go to a music store or a music uh, event, a NAM symposium, uh, there there isn't um, that uh, dismissiveness. Are you waiting for someone? I remember I went into a music store when I was in my twenties, and uh, I just stood there. And these guys were behind the counter. I just stood there waiting at the counter. And finally, like five or six minutes later, somebody goes are you waiting for someone? And I said, I'm waiting for you to sell me some strings, <laughs> you know? So that doesn't happen anymore. I feel like I get, I get more respect. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I also wanted to talk about the Everybody's Making Money song. Everybody's making money but me. Mm -hmm. When I first heard the title, I heard the beginning of the song, I was, I don't, this is where my brain went. I thought you were going to say like other musicians are more popular than me or making more money than me. And that wasn't it at all. It was, again, this celebration of I love what I'm doing. I'm jamming. This is the thing I love doing. Mm -hmm. And I got to pay the photographer and I got to pay this and I got to rent the hotel. And I got like all these things go into making this happen for me. Yeah. And it's, to me, I took a lot of this album as sort of a tongue in cheek. Like it wasn't all like, Oh, it was like, this is great. And <laughs> yeah, hard. it's just ironic. You know, there's, there's these whole industries that, uh, that we artists, we do need, we need PR agents. Uh, we need, you know, we need uh, the airlines and the hotels. We need ASCAP to collect our royalties and all that stuff. But uh, yeah, it, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of services that I have that I pay a monthly fee to be a part of, you know, and for, to, you know, whether it's making videos or audio or whatever it is. And so at the end of the day, the artist 
is the one that gets the least amount of money. So, it, you know, it's kind of, I love what I do, but a lot of what we do is, um, frankly, it's not recognized for the stimulative effect that we have on the economy. And uh, how many people are employed peripherally around the artist. And, uh, you know, there's sound crews, stage crafters, there's all these people that are out of work. And that's a big, that's a big issue in England right now, which is actually where I wrote the song. I wrote the song in, in a, a very low rent uh, hotel room uh, in England, uh, uh, in Folkestone, England. And you could actually see the White Cliffs of Dover from outside the front door. It was pretty cool, but it was a really weird hotel. <laughs> <laughs> and at, during that tour, um, uh, Dudley Ross was wonderful to put this together, but we had to rent a van. We had to get hotels. We had to hire musicians. I had to pay him. I'm not going to have him, you know, he's not going to work for free. And then at the end of the day, there wasn't any money for me. There just wasn't. And so I just sold CDs and that's how I, but it was like an all expenses trade uh, trip, all expenses paid trip. To England. So like you said, I try to keep it positive um, and, uh, and kind of laugh about it. Some of it's not very laughable. I wish Spotify's CEO didn't take so much money and would give us a little more than 0. 0.0018 cents per stream. So there's some issues that are kind of like, hey, you know, this isn't fair. And the Musicians Union is working hard to try to uh, remedy some of these uh, disparities. But uh, but it's still worth it. It's still worth it to me. I love it. All right. I know that uh, we're pushing in at almost a half an hour oh, now. I sorry. Got, no, no. I know you got. I can blab a lot. I love this. I'm loving everything about this. But I just wanted to let everybody know if they want to unmute themselves and ask you any questions. I'm going to put links to all this stuff we've been talking about in the bottom too, like where should be playing and all these people you're mentioning. Um, let's see, we plugged a little bit your gig tonight, the Blue Diamond. Anything else you want to plug besides like go buy Lisa's album? <laughs> yeah, well, you can find it at, at lisaman.bandcamp.com. And actually, pretty soon I'll be putting my um, uh, previous catalog up on, uh, on that Bandcamp page and selling them there too. And then you can get the actual physical CD like I got. I like to listen to yes. a CD in my car, or you can download just the audio file. That's right. Have on your phone or however you listen to music. That's exactly right. All right. Anybody got questions for Ms. Lisa Mann? Fire away. Julia. I have a question. So how do make musicians make money anymore? <laughs> Well, you know, I think it just depends on uh, your role in the business. A lot, uh, most musicians obviously are not band leaders. They are uh, hired guns and they make money playing gigs and doing studio work. And a lot of them uh, do lessons. So my husband, for instance, he plays with Sugar Ray Rayford. Um, and, you know, they can't tour right now, which is really rough but he's put some gigs together with some local musicians and he's been teaching some lessons online. Uh, me as a band leader, um, I can make money from gigs or I uh, make money from CD sales, but I also get some money um, from streaming income uh, from Spotify and Napster and those other services. And I also get some royalties uh, when I get, um, some uh, radio play, especially on the internet. So if I get, especially if I, if I get, and I actually did get uh, one song on Sirius XM, Bluesville, then I will receive some royalties when, when that gets played. It just, it seems like it's harder now. I mean, I think it, it seems like musicians are working harder for their money since streaming started. Is that true? Yeah, because people aren't buying uh, the physical product so much anymore. And it also depends on if the artist has, um, uh, uh, if you have a record deal, then a lot of times the, the amount that the artist makes isn't, isn't much at all. Yeah. So, 
it all depends on what kind of, I'm, I'm independent, so it just depends on what kind of arrangement the artist has. But yeah, it's, it's rough. There's a whole, there are whole industries that are making lots of money and a lot of artists that are, we, we have to be, we, it's basically a data entry job. We have to find out where that money is and fill in all these forms and all this blank, because if you don't, it's on the table and you're not picking it up. Wow. Yeah. Fascinating. I'll buy more CDs. <laughs> Thank you. That always helps. That always helps an artist. Yeah, definitely. But also adding us to Spotify does help us. It really does. So if you use Spotify or Amazon or iTunes, if you have a playlist, add our songs to your playlist. And it really, it really does. Eventually it adds up. So that's still, that's still a way to support an artist. Subscribe to our YouTube channel, that kind of thing. All those little things, they do add up. Now, I didn't know that. What happens when we add you to the playlist? It just puts you in a higher rotation or? Well, they have an algorithm. It's like, you know, this, they're little robots that, that uh, find out that people are listening. And the more you listen on Spotify to whatever artist, and maybe it's me, uh, the more likely one of my songs is to be picked up by Spotify's editorial playlists. And these playlists can be really, really long. A lot of them are like uh, women of blues playlist, uh, uh, contemporary blues playlist or something like that. Right. And so people just, they're vacuuming, cooking, and they got the music on in the background and that, and that's really how it works. Cool. Well, I've heard this Dolly Parton story before about how Elvis tried to record I Will Always Love You. And she, I, she was on some late night show this week and I heard it. Have you heard this story? Here, tell the story. Not yet, no. So she, Whitney Houston, of course, made it super popular, but it was a Dolly song and Elvis yeah. wanted to record it. And his manager was like, yeah, so we're not going to give you any kickback. You, know, you don't, we, we own the song now. And she was like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, hold this. Is, this is my music. I wrote That's this. Right. And so she said, thank you, but no, thank you. She's a businesswoman. Can, isn't that interesting that, and this was what, in the 60s, maybe? Wow. And she was that forward thinking to know that's where the money is, is owning the actual song, not recording it. She was thrilled when Whitney Houston recorded it. She was yeah. like, great. And Madonna was the same way, too. She was very business savvy. Lady Gaga, also. Uh, um, who's the young woman who was the country artist? Um, you know who I'm talking about? Uh, I can't remember Musgrave. Name. Taylor Swift. I see Musgrave. Huh? Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Taylor Swift. Very business savvy. Yeah. And you have to be. Yeah. Kathy Griffin, this is an interesting story, and I know I could I can talk forever. Brilliant. Kathy Griffin, I really admire her because she did that really controversial photo and it just destroyed her career. Or people destroyed her career. It was just a quick gag. It was like, yeah, it, she didn't think anything of it really. And then it blew up in her face. And because her catalog, their price went way down, uh, she bought her entire catalog. And now anything that's Kathy Griffin, that's recorded, videotaped, any of it, she owns it. And now people are like, you know, let's get over it. We can't just censor everybody's free speech. And now her, you know, her catalog's a lot worth a lot more. And she's basically in a better position than she was in the first place. Oh my gosh, that's interesting. Yeah. I love it. All right. So you gotta have the business mind, even as an artist and musician. Yeah. That's why my elbow's all red. This is mostly where I'm at, is it the computer. <laughs> Not the base, it's the computer. Oh, aren't we all nowadays? Yeah. All right, anybody else got questions for Lisa? Speak now. All right, this was so much fun. I was looking forward to this all week. I love you. seeing you live. I love watching your Facebook live feeds, live streams. You're a champ. You're a rock star. Very kind. Thank you. And Judy. Oh, hey. And I had a quick question. Can I get her on Pandora? Her music? 
You know, I don't know. I think it's been submitted to Pandora. I'll check. You know, that's I'll always hit or miss. If you actually, you know what? If you search for me on Pandora, it makes it more likely that they'll add me because they don't I'll add do everybody. I'll do that. Thank you. I've enjoyed it, Lisa, very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's Lisa Man with two N's, Judy. Two M-A-N-N. N's. N -N. Right. Yeah, I'm already looking her up. <laughs> <laughs> cool. <laughs> yeah, and I've liked your YouTube. Or I've subscribed to your YouTube channel. Thank you. I'm we'll be adding a new things. video soon for that monkey song. <laughs> Please tell me there's live monkeys in the video. No, they're stuffed monkeys. They're toy monkeys. <laughs> and they're really cute. <laughs> I love it. Well, I hope you have a blast at your gig tonight. Thank you. And I'll keep following you online. All right. And Appreciate it. Continued success. Thank you very much. So nice chatting thank with you. you. Thank you. All right. Yes. Thank you. All right. Bye. Bye.